based on SGL2 inhibitors. We have heard a lot from yesterday onwards on this molecule, the benefits, the renoprotective, cardioprotective, weight lowering and no side effects. And to speak on this, we have Dr. Sanjay Kaldra, who is already introduced and given them lectures also in the morning. So over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are supposed to be very fast acting and they have a sustained effect. So considering that we are running short of time, we will have a very fast talk, but we hope that the effects of this talk will remain sustained in our minds and in our clinics. Uh, just to carry on with the question about uh, prevalence of type 1 diabetes, in Karnal district in Haryana, we did this study a few years ago, uh, the prevalence of type 1 diabetes in our district is 12 per 1 lakh population, but in urban Karnal it is 26 per 1 lakh. Yes. And uh, what I feel over the past 2-3 years is that that uh, incidence has gone down, gone up maybe by 10 or 20 times. And earlier we used to see balanopostitis so rarely. And then we used to see it in young men. Uh, now in past 1 year I have encountered balanopostitis in 4 year old boys, in 7 year old boys, in 2 year old boys with type 1 diabetes. And, and I really don't know what to make of this change in, uh, in uh, morbidity profile. The, the patients are not dying of DKA anymore. So that DKA with capital A is not there anymore. The major amputations are not there anymore. 15 years ago we used to have so much of gas gangrene in our district. Uh, uh, below knee amputation, above knee amputation. That is all finished. But this new kind of morbidity is coming up. Ketosis, uh, balanopostitis. And these are important because these, are, these have relation to our topic for today. Uh, about myths and realities of SGLT2 inhibitor. We all know that SGLT2 inhibitors are ranked right at the top in the ACE algorithm in terms of safety and tolerability. Yet in our country, the use of these drugs is not so much. One of the reasons is that there are many myths related to these drugs. So let's try to discuss them. Now it's not that the physician has these myths just like that. The physician is genuinely worried because he or she wants to take care of his patient. And the physician does not want to, in under any circumstances, commit an error of commission. So some of the clinical issues that we worry about are metabolic and hemodynamic and non-metabolic. We will discuss these today and then we will conclude with a simple strategy on how to have safe and pragmatic usage of these drugs. The first is DKA. So why is there this myth about DKA? There were studies on all the SGLT2 inhibitors. There were case reports on all the SGLT2 inhibitors which were noted by the FDA and it was found that ketoacidosis could occur in patients on SGLT2. The term given was euglycemic ketoacidosis. But when you look at large data sets, whether on DAPA or CANA or EMPA, you find that the incidence is very, very low. And even when DKA occurs in such patients, it occurs because SGLT2 are being used off-label. What are the predisposing factors for DKA or euglycemic ketoacidosis in SGLT2? They are patients who have either an acute illness, which may be metabolic or surgical. Any acute decompensation, metabolic, surgical, orthopedic. Or they have acute carbohydrate restriction, fluid restriction or insulin restriction. So just in two lines we can understand everything. Either an acute medical or surgical insult or an acute carbohydrate restriction that means the patient is not taking orally. Acute fluid restriction, the patient goes into dehydration or acute insulin restriction. The patient does not have adequate endogenous or exogenous insulin. If we are able to take care of all this, then we know when to prescribe SGLT2. So if you have a patient who is dehydrated, who has inadequate endogenous insulin, then these drugs are not to be given. But the label also does not allow us to give to them. If you have a patient who is already calorie restricted, who is malnourished, who is on a very low calorie diet, then it is not a good idea to give SGLT2 inhibition. Because very low calorie diet is as it is, it is ketogenic. And on top of that you are adding a ketogenic drug. So experts have concluded that the prevalence of DK is infrequent. The risk-benefit ratio is in favor of prescribing, but we should just make sure that we avoid catabolic states. Ensure good fluid and carbohydrate intake in our patients and watch for any acute medical or surgical compromise. If it occurs, you discontinue the drug for a short period of time. We then move on to hemodynamic issues. And one of the biggest 
complaints or stresses, the things that we worry about is, are these drugs safe in hot and humid climates like us? The answer comes from this paper and if you see, uh, Trivandrum should be proud because the first author is from Trivandrum, is Matthew John. I think he is not here in the hall. But what Dr. Matthew John has uh, and his colleagues have uh, uh, analyzed is that the drug is very safe to use and it is equally effective in India as it is in other parts of the country. In fact, the side effects are less, if at all, if you look at the numerical values. The reason is that in our country, we drink water all the time. In France, 15 years ago, there was a heat wave, temperature was 31 degrees and 10,000 people died at 31 degrees centigrade. The reason was they never knew that they have to drink water. They were drinking only wine. Seriously. And then the government had to put a public health campaign that everybody drink water so that you don't die of 31 degrees. So in hot and humid climates like ours, uh, it is not an issue at all giving SGL2 inhibitors provided we drink water which otherwise also we are doing. The extra diuresis with SGL2 inhibition is just 350 ml. That is one and a half glasses of water. That is all that the patient has to drink extra. Another issue is acute kidney injury. Why this is related to hot and humid climates again is that just recently USFD has noted that acute kidney injury can occur. Just about half an hour ago we discussed that actually SGL2 inhibitors are nephroprotective and they reduce the GFR if given in the chronic kidney disease in the early stages of chronic kidney disease irrespective of renovascular phenotype they are protective. At the same time, there is an issue of acute kidney injury. The same rules that we followed for DKA, the same rules come through here. If there is a risk factor for acute kidney injury, these are in general the catabolic states. Patient already has chronic kidney disease with GFR less than 45 or less than 30. Do not give. If patient has CCF or hypovolemia because of any cause, do not give. And if patient is taking nephrotoxic drugs like loop diuretic, NSAID or very high dose of RAS blockade, then think twice. The question was asked, what about the benefits of uh, SGLT2 over and above RAS blockade? They are safe to use, but even with RAS blockade, you do watch for hyperkalemia. That same watch should be kept. The myth is that it causes kidney damage. The reality actually is that it improves kidney parameters, renal parameters. And if you watch for, uh, if you do safe patient, good patient selection, you can actually use these drugs easily. Apart from the metabolic and hemodynamic issues, we also have non-metabolic issues. I mentioned that the prevalence of balanoposthitis has gone up markedly where I work. With SGLT2 inhibitors, it is thought that urinary tract infections may increase, but the reality is no. The same prevalence of UTI is there in, with placebo and with SGLT2 inhibition. However, mycotic infections do increase, genital mycotic infections do increase with uh, SGLT2 inhibition and these are more in men than in, uh, more in women than in men, more in uncircumcised population than in circumcised population. So this difference also we should know. But if you are able to teach perennial hygiene, to all your patients and the simple thing for men retract the prepuce and wash if you feel that with water you are not doing a good job then you need to use normal saline just half a teaspoon of salt in a mug of water you just need to get 0.9 or 1 percent normal saline and you clean the glands with that that is enough for perennial hygiene avoid use of Dettol and Savlon and avoid indiscriminate use of antimycotic drugs because again in Haryana we are seeing a lot of resistance to fluconazole now which we did not have few years ago. So all we need to teach is perennial hygiene and we can prevent the mycotic infections. In the morning, uh, we spoke about me being from Haryana and struggling with English language. So one of our doctors actually went to the ADA and the, the, the lady there, she was, the doctor was speaking about 6% mycotic infection with empagliflozin in Empareg. And our doctor heard mitotic, M-I-T-O-T-I-C. So he stood up and said, how can you manage 6% mitotic uh, rate because mitosis means cancer. So now the lady is saying 6% mycotic is not such an issue. All you have to do is give one capsule of fluconazole or one tablet of fluconazole and so it's not an issue. And this Haryanvi doctor is stuck. No madam, 6% is too much. That is life threatening. And then finally that American lady, she had to you know submit and said okay, if you are such a good doctor and you are not even willing to have 6% infection rate in your clinic, then hats off to you, turbans off to you and empagliflozin is not meant for you. <laughs> so it is not mitotic, it is just mitotic. Mycotic. And the treatment or prevention is just fluconazole, 150 milligram. 
uh, in the Indian subgroup actually and this uh, data comes from Dr. Prasanna Kumar in Bangalore, the risk of mycotic infections is less and it is said that our hygiene habits are better. We use in India what is known as wet hygiene. So we use water for perennial hygiene and that reduces the risk of mycotic infections as compared to the West where dry hygiene is used. Bone safety is another issue and there are many uh, issues related to this. But practically whatever issues are related to fractures, they are related to uh, aspects apart from SGLT2 inhibition. As it is our patients are vitamin D deficient, they are taking lot of other drugs and they are more prone to falls. So the fracture risk is seen to be high with canagliflozin but it is more of upper extremity fracture which is related to falling down. Upper extremity fracture is not related to osteoporosis. It is the hip fracture, femoral neck fracture which is related to osteoporosis that is not increased with canagliflozin. So the drug can be used safely. But like we state that you should avoid use of SGLT2 inhibitor in catabolic state Osteoporosis is also a catabolism of the bone. It is a catabolic state. So in patients with established osteoporosis, it may not be a good idea to use them. Cancer signals have been detected in the past with canagliflozin, with dapagliflozin. But when you look at the large data, there is no evidence of increased cancer with SGLT2. So they can be used very safely. There is an issue about amputations, minor amputations with canagliflozin and uh, this has been found in the CANVAS trial. However, uh, the European and the American medical agencies have shown, have stated that the study should continue and that it does not seem to be related directly to the drug. Still, we should be careful and if you have a patient with the impending gangrene with symptoms suggestive of peripheral vascular insufficiency, then these drugs should not be used or if you detect these symptoms later on, then you should stop the drug. So the incidence of amputations is higher in canvas, but when you look at all the, uh, all the uh, canagliflozin trials put together, then that signal is absent. And what is the management? Routine preventative foot care and we have had a very good workshop on that, on foot care. So I think the basic messages that we take from the foot care and uh, our doctor from Denmark is here who has taught us about that. Uh, if we just follow that basic clinical advice, sound clinical advice, we should be able to keep our patients safe. Talking of safety, how do we ensure safe and pragmatic use of SGLT2 inhibitors? I will just end with one slide. All patients can be divided into anabolic and catabolic. We have discussed this in Hall B in the morning. If you have a patient who is predominantly anabolic, that is maladaptive anabolism, the patient has all the features of metabolic syndrome which are predisposed to by insulin resistance. So the patient has diabetes, hypertension, obesity and lipids. SGLT2 will convert this maladaptive uh, scenario it will improve it, it will make it adaptive, it will do an offloading. SGLT2 is strongly indicated in patients with maladaptive anabolism. This would be around 50% of our clinics. Some patients will be eubolic, they have diabetes, but in general there is a balance between anabolism and catabolism. Here you can give any drug that you want, you can give SGLT2 also. But there will be 10% patients who are catabolic, they have predominant insulin deficiency. And these are patients where SGLT2 inhibitors are contraindicated. Here the drug of choice would be insulin or if insulin is not required then a secretagogue like sulfonylurea. If we are able to just understand this single slide, we will be able to understand in which patients to give SGLT2 inhibitor and more importantly in which patients not to give. If we are able to give to the correct patients, which would mean around 50 to 70 percent of our clinic population, then very easily we can have safe and pragmatic use of these drugs and we will be able to dispel the myths that surround their use. Thank you. The speaker has actually ruled out all the myths against this drug by various trials. So open for discussion. I think uh, Sanjay, uh, you have beautifully put forth the most important issue and the publication the, in the newspaper some time back, you know that, uh, about the cases saying that it did produce uh, decay. But we went through all the cases, it's exactly what you have put here. They were thin built, cachectic, they were either LADA or type 1 with or small insulin yes. So if you give to the proper selection of patient, SGLT2 under full drop. Are very safe. Yes. And the, the second point that you pointed out is also extremely important that it has lot of pleiotropic benefits and to access pleiotropic benefits, you must also guide.
right rise to it like you said about water intake you said about things like that which are which are extremely important and uh, probably you know the new term that has now been coined is called i told you in the meeting to the to nutritional offloaders uh, the news of sir we the if we take less food we live longest there is a, there is a full conference saying that if you take less food less meat don't fast every day i mean i mean at least two third of the food that we take is is all right one third or one fourth we don't take we live the longest but there are ways now where, where you can eat whatever you want to eat then you can waste nutritional offloaders we can offload the nutrition either by exercise or whatever yoga or whatever or these are the drugs which help in offloading and this is a good concept to say that these drugs have come to stay because of the multifarious effects thank you thank you sir